I'm Dr. Mark Catala, and I want to welcome you to the 13th chapter of the OpenStack Psychology textbook. Today we'll be discussing industrial organizational psychology, what that is, and also a little bit about human factor psychology. So the chapter begins with a quote that while people are more productive when they're alone, they're more collaborative and innovative when they're together. Now in 2012, people who worked in the U.S. spent an average of 56 hours per week working, and sleeping is the only other activity that they spent more time on. So industrial and organizational psychology is a branch of psychology that studies how human behavior and psychology affect work and how they are affected by work. Now, industrial and organizational psychologists work in four main contexts, academia, government, consulting firms, and business, and most have a master's or a doctorate degree. Industrial psychology is concerned with describing job requirements and assessing individuals for their ability to meet those requirements, and organizational psychology is a discipline interested in how the relationships among employees affect those employees and their performance of a business. And that includes studying worker satisfaction, motivation, and commitment. Human factor psychology is the study of how workers interact with the tools of work and how to design those tools to optimize workers' productivity, safety, and health. And in Europe, human factors is called ergonomics. Well, let's talk a little bit about the history and the development of IO psychology. So James Cattell contributed to psychology, um, or to industrial psychology. It's primarily in his founding of a psychological consulting company called the Psychological Corporation, which is still operating today. And it publishes a lot of tests and in the accomplishments of his students at Columbia University in the area of industrial psychology. Now, Hugo Munsterberg, who's pictured there to the right, in 1913, he published Psychology and Industrial Efficiency, which covered topics such as employee satisfaction, employee training, and effective advertising. I actually have a 1913 copy of the book. So during the First World War, Robert Yerkes organized a group under the Surgeon General's office that developed methods for screening and selecting enlisted men. So they basically gave them tests, the Army Alpha and Beta tests. The Army Alpha test was designed to measure mental abilities, and it was very much like an ACT or an SAT because it had math problems, it had reading, so you read a passage and you, then you answer questions about it, and it also had multiple choice questions. This is the, the test that they were actually invented for. The Army Beta test was a nonverbal form of the test that was administered to people who were illiterate and to non-English speaking draftees. And so the beta test had things like digit substitution tasks and mazes. From 1923 to 1932, or excuse me, 1929 to 1932, Elton Mayo and his colleagues began a series of studies at Western Electric's Hawthorne Works. And this began his research into the effects of physical work environment, such as the amount of light that was in a factory. But the researchers found that the psychological and social factors in the factory were of more interest than the physical factors. So the studies also examined how human interaction factors such as supervisor style enhanced or decreased productivity. And these studies really mark the origin of organizational psychology. An analysis of the findings by later researchers led to the term the Hawthorne effect, which describes the increase in performance of individuals who are noticed, watched, and paid attention to by researchers or supervisors. What the original researchers found was that any change in a variable, such as the lighting levels in the factory, led to an improvement in productivity, and that this was true even when the change was supposed to be negative, so that they reduced the amount of lighting in the factory, they still found that productivity increased. Kurt Lewin is considered the founder of social psychology by some, and much of his work produced results that had important influences in organizational psychology. 
Lewin was responsible for coming up with the term group dynamics, and he was involved in studies of group interactions, cooperation, competition, and communication that bear on organizational psychology. In 1911, Frederick Taylor published The Principles of Scientific Management, and it examined management styles, personal, personnel selection and training, and the work itself using time and motion studies. And he was actually an engineer who realized that if you redesigned the workplace, everybody would benefit, both workers and the owners of the businesses. <clears throat> Excuse me. Taylor showed that workers could be more productive by taking work rests. So there's an example uh, in your book about moving these iron ingots and it increased uh, by adding work rests, it increased worker productivity um, considerably with less fatigue. And at the same time, the company's cost was reduced significantly um, by allowing these work rests. Lillian Gilbreth is an absolutely fascinating person. Now uh, she used time and motion studies um, also with her husband, uh, Frank, and they worked to make workers more efficient by reducing the number of motions required to perform a task. Now, some of her contributions are still used today. So you can thank her for the idea of putting shelves on the inside of refrigerators. And she also came up with the concept of the foot pedal trash can, which I have in my own home. So I have to thank uh, Dr. Lillian Gilbreth for that. She and her husband also had 12 children. And there are there's a book and there are actually two movies based on it called Cheaper by the Dozen. Uh, the book was actually written by two of her children who described her as a genius in the art of living. What's happened since World War II? Well, the Society for Industrial and Organizational Psychology, which is PSYOP, that has 8,000 members as of 2014. The Bureau of Labor has projected that this profession will have the greatest growth of all job classifications in the 20 years following 2012, and on average, a person with a master's degree in IO psychology will earn over $80,000 a year, while someone with a doctorate will earn over $110,000 a year. So I'm in the wrong job. Um, not really, though. Um, I'm very happy with my job. There are two related but different approaches to job analysis. And I guess I should define job analysis. Uh, job analysis means accurately describing the task or job that you're doing. The first approach is task oriented and lists in detail the tasks that will be performed for the job. So each task is typically rated on scales for how frequently it's performed, how difficult it is, and how important it is for the job. The second, second approach is worker oriented. And this approach describes the characteristics required of the worker to successfully perform the job and has been called job specification. Research suggests that accuracy and reliability of job analysis can depend on the nature of the descriptions and the source for the job analysis. So research uh, has found that job analyses developed from descriptions provided by people holding the job themselves were actually the least reliable. And the researchers did not speculate on why that was the case, so I guess we can. Candidate analysis and testing. Um, so candidates' knowledge, skills, and other abilities must be evaluated and compared with the job description. Evaluations may include testing, an interview, and work samples or exercises. Personality tests may be used to identify the personality characteristics that would ensure good performance on a job. So for example, someone who's high in agreeableness, that's one of the big five personality characteristics, uh, they might be good in a customer support position because people who are high in agreeableness don't seek conflict. A personal interview is often a part of the selection process. An interview from, excuse me, information from job analysis usually forms the basis of the types of questions asked. I should also point out that social factors and body language also can influence an interview. And this is things like similarity between the applicant and the interviewer and nonverbal behaviors like nodding and smiling um, can have an impact on the interview too. There's two types of interviews, unstructured and structured. In an unstructured interview, 
the interviewer can ask different questions to each candidate. And in a structured interview, the interviewer asks the exact same questions of every candidate. And not surprisingly, it's been found that structured interviews are more effective at predicting subsequent job performance. Now, an important goal of orientation training is to educate the new employee how the organizations run, how it operates, and how it makes decisions. Mentoring is a form of informal training in which an experienced employee guides the work of a new employee. And research so shows small but significant impacts for people who have mentors. They have higher compensation and promotions and greater job satisfaction uh, over time too. Mentoring is thought to be particularly important to the career success of women. How about uh, evaluating employees? Well, we can do performance appraisals. And these are typically documented several times a year, often with a formal process in an annual face-to-face -face brief meeting between an employee and their supervisor. I have to go through those every three years. 360 degree feedback appraisal is when an employee's appraisal derives from a combination of ratings from different people. And those people are supervisors, peers, and the person themselves. The, pur the purpose is to give the employee and supervisor different perspectives on the employee's job performance. Many performance evaluations are disliked by organizations, employees, or both. I dislike uh, having to do them. I think they're a complete waste of time. The question is, do they improve or motivate employees? The research uh, that has been done does not bear out the effectiveness of these techniques, but they still do them. Bias and protections in hiring. Hiring decisions are often based on many factors besides a person's matching a job. So physical attractiveness benefits individuals in job-related outcomes, such as hiring, promotion, and performance reviews. To combat hiring discrimination in the United States, there are laws that prevent hiring based on group membership criteria. So for example, it's illegal to ask questions in an interview about a person's age, if they're married, whether they have any disabilities, what their race or religion are. The U.S. Equal Op Employment Opportunity Commission, or EEOC, enforces federal laws that make it illegal to discriminate against a job applicant or employee because of race, color, religion, sex, national origin, age, disability, or genetic information. There's also the Equal Pay Act, and this says that the same pay um, has, you have to have the same pay for men and women who are doing the same job. Yet, there are still discrepancies in pay, even when education, life choices, and a host of other variables are taken into account. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 says that it's illegal to treat people unfavorably based on what are called immutable characteristics, which are traits of an individual that are fundamental to their identity. The Americans with Disabilities Act, or ADA, this says that people uh, may not be discriminated against due to the nature of their disability. So physical or mental impairment that limits one or more major life activities. So this would be something like hearing, walking, or breathing, and an employer must make reasonable accommodations for the person to be able to do their job. However, there are exceptions, and these are what are called bona fide occupational qualifications, or BFOQs. And these are requirements of certain occupations for which denying an individual employment would otherwise violate the law. So an example would be hiring somebody to be the head of a religious charity. You could stipulate that that person has to be part of the religion. So they have to be. So if you're running a Catholic charity, you can say, well, the person who runs the charity also has to be Catholic. Now, the most common reason for invoking a BFOQ is sex or gender. So, for example, Hooters, which is, I think they sell uh, chicken wings, they only hire female wait staff. And um, they've so far avoided a court decision by males who want to be uh, hired as wait staff by settling out of court with plaintiffs. Job satisfaction describes the degree to which individuals enjoy their job, and that's impacted by the work, the personality, and the culture. 
So work content factors are the most strongly predictive of overall job satisfaction. And that includes, does the job have variety? What's the difficulty level? And what is the role clarity? You know, what's your job uh, defined as? Surprisingly, there's only a weak correlation between pay level and job satisfaction. Low satisfaction is related to withdrawal behaviors, stress, and job insecurity. And job insecurity would be things like downsizing and corporate mergers. Downsizing involves laying off a significant percentage of a company's employees. And IO psychologists are involved at every level. So how the news is delivered, uh, separation packages, etc. And they also help with supporting employees who are retained. Now I have a this is this I have a friend who actually is an IO psychologist working in industry. And I've asked him, what's it like to fire people all day in a downsizing situation? He always dodges the question, though, uh, because it is stressful. And he says that he hires a lot more people than he fires. Work-family balance is when people juggle the demands of work life with the demands of their home life. Now, women often have greater responsibility for family demands and show greater levels of stress from work-family conflict. A possible solution is telecommuting, where employees work from home and set their own hours. But ironically, being home can increase stress because the family's demands are made more evident. Let's talk about management and organizational structure. This idea of scientific management is a theory of management that analyzes and synthesizes workflows with the main objective of improving economic efficiency, especially labor productivity. Two different theories, Theory X and Theory Y. Theory X says that managers assume that most people dislike their work and are not innately self-directed. So they make employees punch a clock in the morning uh, and when they leave work too. Theory Y says that managers assume most people seek inner satisfaction and fulfillment from their work so that they include employees in participating in what the work goals are going to be. At this point, you may be asking yourself, what are some vaguely defined leadership styles? Well, transactional leaders, uh, for them, the focus is on supervision and organizational goals, which are achieved through rewards and punishment. Transformational leaders, though, are charismatic, inspirational, intellectually stimulating, and considerate leaders. I'm willing to bet that all people who run companies think that they're transformational leaders because they think they're charismatic and inspirational. Leadership styles of men tend to be task-oriented and women tend to be interpersonal. Work teams bring together diverse skills, experience, and expertise. And teams can be uh, ineffective, though, because of social loafing, poor communication, conformity effects, and conflict. There's three different types of teams. Problem resolution teams who solve problems, creative teams who develop innovative solutions, and tactical teams who execute a well-defined plan or objective. Those people seem very excited to be on that team. Every company has an organizational culture, and those are the values, visions, hierarchies, norms, and interactions among the employees. Now, part of this can be diversity training, and this educates participants about cultural differences with the goal of improving teamwork. A negative aspect of organizational culture could be a culture of harassment. And for example, an example, this is quid pro quo, where you give something to get something. And this refers to a situation in which organizational rewards are offered in exchange for sexual favors, but harassment does not have to be sexual. Workplace violence is defined as any act or threat of physical violence, harassment, intimidation, or other threatening disruptive behavior. Interestingly, murder is the second leading cause of death in the workplace and the primary cause of death for women. Triggers for violence are feelings of being treated unfairly, unjustly, or being disrespective, and that predicts the violence against a supervisor. Other research finds that job security and alcohol consumption, surprise, surprise, predicts aggression against subordinates. 
Human factor psychology uh, is the integration of the human machine interface in the workplace. That's some jargon right there. Uh, it focuses on workers' interaction with the machine, their workstation, information displays, and the local environment. Now, many of the concerns of human factor psychology are related to workplace safety. So, for example, airlines. And they recommend things like checklists. And so this is when you go through a detailed list of different parts of um, pr or procedures to make sure that everything is working correctly prior to takeoff. And astronauts go through their own checklists too. And hey, add this to your checklist that all of your problems, or at least all of your APA style problems can be solved through my Learn APA Style book. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA Style, which are about writing and psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day and thanks for listening.